You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Welcome to the show, everybody. Your host, Michael. Hope everybody's having a good Sunday so far. Going to be uh, doing a little bit of a discussion here about the Jewish roots of the Catholic faith. Joined here with our guest, Daniel Suazo, who is a Jewish Catholic. How are you, Daniel? Welcome to the show. I'm doing fantastic. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Michael. I hope you're doing well over there. I'm doing well, and I'm glad to have you on. You know, quite a few people uh, reached out to me, several of my patrons, and then just other people uh, emailed wow. me and said to get you on the show. So <laughs> here we are. Awesome. And, you know, like I said, I saw that you did uh, a show. For me, it was yesterday. Yep. For you, it's still today. Uh, yep. you, did a a show, <laughs> you did a show with Swan, who I did a show with yesterday as well. But for wow. you, it's today because you're in Tokyo. So. <laughs> That's right. What a crazy thing. I know, right? <laughs> That's right. pretty amazing. So, yeah, let, let's go ahead and, uh, you know, dive in. Tell me a little bit about your your background and how you ended up uh, becoming a Catholic. Sure. I'll give you the shorter version. And if we want to dig into it later, we can do that. But in essence, um, my family's heritage is Sephardic Jewish, which basically means Jewish people that come from either Spain, the Iberian Peninsula area, mm. North Africa. They ended up moving to Central America. Part of them were the conversos, which is people that got forced to convert. And some of them were just hidden Jews. Mm -hmm. um, from that time, they started kind of drifting away from the faith until the point that my family wasn't really practicing anything in a religious sense, more just believing that God existed. And then later on, when my father, who was the first one to move out of Central America, he went to New York, and then my mother, they became part of the Pentecostal Protestant movement. And I was born in New York, and then from there we moved around a bunch of times. Now I'm in Tokyo, and throughout my time, even when I was in the States, I was basically for the first part of my childhood raised as a Protestant Pentecostal Christian. Mm -hmm. Then I ended up becoming part of the Messianic Jewish movement, and that was for over a decade. And then more recently, on the path towards Catholic Orthodoxy. So that's the the super yeah. short version of and, it. And, and what got you interested in Catholicism going kind of from Messianic Judaism? Because they, they tend to be pretty, pretty different. Quite different. Um, and, and it's actually not that I tried to get into it. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, it all began with me trying to debunk, <laughs> debunk the church, which is kind of hilarious to me because... I was like, nah, these people are completely wrong. And I was raised extremely anti-Catholic, believing that Catholics worshipped the Pope, worshipped Mary, worshipped the saints, were cannibalists and cultic, all types of crazy things. But it all really began in that process. Additionally, on top of that, it was just me trying to find out what the earliest believers in Yeshua, Jesus, actually lived a lot of times when I was uh, in the Messianic Jewish movement and I would go to study history, I would be looking at Jewish Jewish literature, right? Mm -hmm. So that would include things like the Mishnah, the Talmud, the Zohar, and all these different rabbinical writings. But it wasn't until I stopped and I thought, wait a second, what about the earliest believers? What did they actually live out? And then from there, I ended up finding writings like the Didache, the mm -hmm. Pre-Nicene Fathers, the Apostolic Fathers, uh, Irenaeus, Papias, Polycarp, mm -hmm. Clement of Rome, and then that's when everything started to change for me, and it really made that switch in my mind. Of course, it wasn't that easy. It actually took a lot of fighting within myself mm -hmm. to come to the conclusion that the Catholic Church is not at all what I had been taught when I was a child, and that it actually was the fulfillment of temple judaism yeah that, that's what did it for me the apostolic fathers i bet you found justin martyr's um you know dialogue with trifo pretty interesting what would you think about that one 
Yeah, actually, that that was one of my more recent discoveries. Mm -hmm. A couple months back, I started looking into his work. And the first thing when I first started looking into that, um, some people said that it was an actual debate. Some people mm -hmm. said that this was an imaginary opponent. Mm -hmm. Regardless of it, the work was actually quite outstanding. Uh, he was hitting points that maybe I wouldn't have thought of initially. But then as you continue to read through this debate, if you will, um, he targets things that I realized that the mentality of way back in the day is different. Mm. Um, so I thought that was really interesting to see his take on it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I found it to be really interesting. I mean, I don't know if you, you know my background, but um, I lived in Israel for seven years, was nominally, I mean, nominally told to, uh, well, I was told to practice Judaism as a kid, and I just kind of nominally did, so I didn't have any kind of wow. convictions, but I had just a little bit of exposure to it. So whenever I started reading the Apostolic Fathers, the first place I went was just a Martyr's Dialogue wow. with Trifo, just because I found it uh, interesting, given that that background. So yeah, I, I imagine when you started reading the Apostolic Fathers, you started to see some very different things than what you oh, probably yeah. have been exposed to when it comes to messianic yep. judaism you, even though that that particular group is pretty diverse itself but um Correct. yeah uh, so you, you start to go through this uh i guess paradigm shift and and, and what happens so as i started looking at these ancient writings again previous to this all of my knowledge had been coming from either the scriptures or from jewish sources. Mm -hmm. When I started looking into the uh, apostolic fathers in specific, people like Clement of Rome and Polycarp, what started to creep me out, to be honest with you, <laughs> was the emphasis on the Eucharist. And I, right. that was the first thing. Because to me, as in Messianic Judaism, we didn't even practice it in any form. We did partake in the Shabbat um, initiation, haftala eto, what do you call that? Erev Shabbat, right? When you initiate Shabbat, you have the bread, which is the challah, and then you have the candles, you have the wine. So we had some form of bread and wine every week. Yeah. And it Remember reminded that. us, yeah, as a messianic believer, it did remind us of Yeshua, and we did meditate in his life and death, um, resurrection, if you will. But the difference was, completely different because mm -hmm. of the fact that everybody saw it as a literal sacrifice it wasn't mm -hmm. it wasn't just remembering it wasn't just a cognitive thing it was completely real to them it was really seen as the body and blood of yeshua and when and this is crazy to me also because of the fact that when i would read for example um the writings of shaul paul and he would talk about how some people would take the body and blood uh, in an unworthy manner and that they would end up sick or dead. To me, it's it never clicked that this was actually a serious thing. I thought that nah, maybe they're just not, they're doing it in complete ignorance. They don't even think about Yeshua. They're just kind of having a party, you know, getting drunk and eating. But still, even if that was the case, it would make no sense. And that's what I began to realize for them to be dying, getting sick, for everybody to be talking about this as a sacrifice, for everybody, everybody to be talking about it as if it really was the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Yeshua. Perhaps the terminology was not exactly what we see today, like with transubstantiation and all that. It was still there. And that really bothered me in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But the more I looked into it, the more I studied the more it actually ended up making sense when I started looking at it through the Jewish lens. Yeah, when it comes to this topic of Eucharistic sacrifice in the Apostolic Fathers, what's interesting is, and I'm sure you noted this as well, they're constantly, such as the Didache, appealing to the book of Malachi, the Old yes. Testament, to prove that the Eucharist is a sacrifice. And of right. course, this is the passage from Malachi that talks about in, in every place a sacrifice will be offered and incense will be offered to my name. Yeah. And the, the fathers took that and applied it to the Eucharist 
all yeah. over the place. Like you said, there there's definitely a consensus there. So I imagine that really oh, yeah. got you thinking, okay, well, <laughs> there, there's something to this. And and so you weren't, uh, I guess, finding that, of course, in the um, Messianic uh, Jewish uh, communions. You know, I, I don't imagine there were would be a whole lot of them that would believe in any kind of Eucharistic sacrifice. But again, it's based on Old Testament prophecy. So you would think that that particular community would find it to be most appealing. Right, right. And it would make sense. And I wish somebody would have mentioned it, right? Everything in that movement, as you say, is about going back to the old ways, really making a big deal out of what we find in the Old Testament scriptures, specifically the Torah, the first five books of Moshe. But right, it, it should be something that everybody's looking at, especially in the book of Malachi. And then when you start reading in the Didache, in the ninth and the 14th chapter, I saw that, and that was actually one of the first writings, actually, that I started looking at. And I think I looked at the Didache before I started looking at the Apostolic Fathers, and then that led me down the, the rabbit trail, really, if you will, um, mm -hmm. just looking more into it. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to stick to the pre-Nicene Fathers because the way that I was raised, I was taught, even in the Messianic Jewish movement, I was taught that after Constantine, that's when the church went pagan, right? Yeah. Yeah. Everything went wrong and everything went downhill after that point. So I really made a point of sticking to any type of writings that came previous to that. And that's why it really shocked me because mm -hmm. I couldn't believe that even way back at the very beginning, mm -hmm. the Didache, which is supposed to be attributed as the earliest writing in regards to believers and followers mm -hmm. in Yeshua, some people say that it was even written around the same time that Paul was writing things. Some right. people believe that it was right. written even before the destruction of the temple. Right. So that was radical for me. Yeah, it seems to if I recall correctly, I think the Didache mentions apostles at that time. Yeah. So I mean, it's yeah. definitely first century uh, according to the context. So uh, right. yeah, anybody who reads the Didache, I I'm not sure how you could remain uh, you know, Protestant or non-Catholic at that point. It it, it just would you know, kind of lend itself to, I think, the Catholic position at that point. But yeah. um, so when, when did you uh, join, join the church? Well, this is the thing. Everything started happening for me, this drastic change, a little bit before the beer bug, as some people in the community call it, before this whole health crisis happened, right? Right. Um, because of that, when I started making all these discoveries, I started trying to reach out to to many people and then i started reaching here in japan of course since i live yeah. in tokyo it's hard to find any english speaking sure. priests sure. but on top of that was the fact that every church was closed at this point when i started being convicted of this fact that the church was truly the church established by our messiah so i was looking everywhere and everything was closed i couldn't find anything but then later on they started opening little by little and now, I just recently, maybe about a month ago, um, actually started the process of becoming a catechumen. So I'm not actually officially Catholic, are, are but they, I am officially Did they have like an RCIA program? They did in oh, the first like parish that. that I went to. Yeah, but they had canceled it because of this whole thing. Um, gotcha. So what ended up happening is I'm actually in communication with two priests one that I attend that parish regularly and another one, which it's a funny story. Um, the, the gentleman that's going to be pretty much my sponsor, um, he ended up finding a priest and he thought it was an English speaking priest because he looked white. I guess you could say he, he didn't look Japanese. In other words, um, it turns out the guy's Romanian, so he doesn't speak English. And uh, yeah, so I'm in the process now dealing with both of these priests. And uh, actually, just earlier today, I, I had this one on one meeting uh, with the priest, and I've been meeting with him basically going through the whole process. There was a priest that I interviewed in Japan, Institute of Christ, the Sovereign King priest, uh, Father Weda, I, I think was how to pronounce it by. Weda. Yeah, but I, I forget the actual spelling, but. Um, 
Yeah, I, I interviewed him about Catholicism in Japan, and and he was noting it's it's relatively small. Is is that correct? Yeah, it's quite small. At least, um, I guess it's kind of hard to say. When it comes to traditional Latin Mass, for example, they they used to have it, and now it's pretty much non-existent. Is very few. Uh, gatherings that happen here and that same group goes all the way down south to Osaka to do that as well. In here we have a couple of uh, Novus Ordo masses that get done in about three different parishes and they're very spread apart. So right now where I'm going is about 45 minutes away mm -hmm. which living in Tokyo you realize 45 minutes is like right next door because everything else is so far away. Um, so yeah, it's it's pretty few far and in between. So um, what what kind of uh, parish is it that, that you're attending? Is it a, a, a Novus Ordo, Latin Mass? What, what are you uh, encountering yeah. there? So the very first one that I went to was very, very Novus Ordo. And it was, um, the architecture of the place is really what struck me because as I was learning about Catholicism, I guess for some reason I ended up looking at the more traditional side of things. And I guess it's because it resonates with me as, as a Jewish believer in Jesus. Um, I'm used to tradition. I'm used to temples that look beautiful. I'm used to even seeing the imagery of what you know renditions of what the temple might have looked like mm -hmm. so that type of stuff really attracted me i'm a really big believer in in beauty and tradition yeah so when i went to this novus ordo uh parish i mean i it was still amazing to me because i was looking at the priest and i recognized that this was someone that had legit authority from all the way back from yeshua to be able to consecrate uh, the bread and wine so that it would be the body and blood of Yeshua. Then now I ended up discovering another parish, which is the one that I attend now. It's it pretty much a cathedral. The architecture is beautiful. It's extremely reverent. Um, and they, they even have to set up so that they could do a traditional Latin mass if, if they mm -hmm. wanted to. Uh, it's still a Novus Ordo, but it was completely different from that first parish that I went to and what it's attracted me to this one. Kind of a high mass yeah. Novus Ordo, I guess. Yeah. 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 Beautiful, beautiful mm. place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those, those are good. Yeah, that's kind of what, what I have here myself is just yeah. kind of a reverent Novus Ordo. Um, right. you, you know, you might also, I, I don't know how many of these you would find in Japan, but some of the Eastern Catholic uh, churches and some of their liturgies, um, I don't know if you've, uh, looked into them a lot yet, but you would uh, probably really enjoy them because there's a whole lot of connection between uh, the temple of the Old Testament and the way that the liturgy is done uh, in the Eastern rites, especially the Byzantine form. Although some of the um, even non-Byzantine, maybe a little bit more kind of Syriac uh, li liturgies, yeah. those are also pretty influenced by uh uh, you know, Jewish roots. So I, I have you had a chance to see any of those? I don't know how many there are in Japan. Not in, you know? not in person. And I hear, again, see, this is the thing that I, almost uh, the biggest Catholic centers, if you will, are down south by Osaka. So e even though it's I'm here in Tokyo, you would think that being the biggest metropolis in the world, it would have more mm -hmm. churches. Um, mm -hmm. But it's it's not that many yeah. uh but down south i've heard that they do have some eastern catholic mm -hmm. parishes and things like that but i've never been able to experience yeah. one myself i do All get right. told by a lot of people that i should check some out if possible yeah i mean there there's just a whole lot of connections there so i mean let's uh, let's talk a little bit about that you know the right. jewish roots of the catholic faith so yeah. what have you discovered when it comes to this particular topic, what are some of the Jewish aspects and roots to our faith? Well, let's begin with the fact that our Messiah is Jewish himself, that mm -hmm. the Blessed Mother and the Apostles are Jewish, right? Um, it's, I think what really, really made this work for me, if you will, was the fact that I was able to see that there was a fluid continuation. And that was in part because of the authority of the church. If we look all the way to the beginning in the time of Moshe, Moses, 
where you had this structure, basically the high court. From there, what was known as the Sanhedrin or the Beitin Hagadol, which is the great court. They always had uh, this type of leadership structure. You had the priests who would be, as it tells us in the book of Deuteronomy, it tells us that these would be the people that can teach, interpret, decree, and make rulings. And this solid body of authority, God tells us in Scripture that whatever they tell us, we should not turn to the left or to the right to whatever they say. In other words, it's just as binding as anything else in the Torah. And then we get to the Mashiach, the, the Messiah, Yeshua, who is the King of Kings. The true priesthood is in him. And in any other form outside of the church, it was invisible to me. I never saw this in the Messianic Jewish movement. No real structure. That's why even though in general, there is an idea of what Messianic Judaism is. But in reality, every single community has their own interpretation. Some believe in the Trinity, some don't. Some believe in rabbinic um, authority, some do not. So there's a lot of aspects to it that um, made it clear to me that when an essential part of the kingdom was having kingdom authority. Mm -hmm. And then when I see in the church that you have the papacy, which reminded me of what we see in the times of Temple Judaism, when you look at the story of Eliakim, and Shevna, it tells us about the steward, the second-hand man in the kingdom. Um, also, I look at the apostles themselves, that they were given the authority by Yeshua, Jesus, to be able to bind things on earth and that they will be bound in heaven, loose on earth, loosed in heaven. So I think authority was the first thing that I saw that connected, that fluid connection it was, from Temple Judaism all the way till now. And I saw that lineage of course, it's not just that. We also have the sacrificial system. So we have the priesthood, we have the sacrifice, and the temple, which is Yeshua. And then through his spirit, we become like temples as well. So in the church was the only place that I could find what looked like the Catholic church or what looked like ancient Israel. Um, I couldn't find it anywhere else. And this is what changed it all for me. So. I think that's the beginning of it all. Yeah, yeah, I, I can definitely see that. And there's so many uh, different places I want to go with this. Let me, um, let me maybe ask this. Um, when it comes to, let's talk about, for example, icons. When you look at the Catholic Church, you'll see images, icons, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, you, especially in our, our Eastern rites, you even might see Catholics bowing down to mm -hmm. <laughs> icons. Um, yeah. did that make you uncomfortable <laughs> given your know, ah. background? Yeah. Yeah. So when we look at the scriptures, everybody always comes back to the same commandment to not make a graven image, to bow down and to worship it. Right. But everybody seems to forget that last part, which is to right. worship it. Right. Um, it wasn't really a big deal to me because I had already understood the scripture from a long time, which tells us, for example, that um, if we look at the Old Testament, we find that in the temple, the Ark of the Covenant itself had two statues, basically, on top of it, the two Keruvim on top of it. We also find out that King Shlomo, King Solomon, had built this gigantic wooden and gold-covered uh, keruvim also in front of the Holy of Holies. We also find out through Josephus that the actual veil that divided the Holy of Holies, that it was uh, the tapestry was filled with celestial imagery. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't something that was completely radical. Rather, it was just me trying to understand why was it done? What was really happening? Because, again, being raised in an anti-Catholic background, I was taught that Catholics were worshiping these things. Mm -hmm. You know, when you see people kiss it, right, kissing the statues. But, again, I had to look at it through the Jewish lens. Mm -hmm. And what happens when the, the, Torah, the Torah scroll gets passed around in the synagogue everybody kisses it mm -hmm. the mezuzah you know what a mezuzah is? Mm -hmm. you lived in Israel. yeah I have, I about have those 
for those of you that may not know, basically it's a, a scroll of scripture that gets put in a little box, a little container, and it gets attached to the doorposts of your home. That comes from the book of Deuteronomy as well. Mm -hmm. um, and what do we do when we enter the house, when we exit the house, or any um, doorpost in your home where you have one, you kiss it. So things like that to me actually clicked. I think part of me, there was a debate because I also was raised in an earlier part of my life as a Protestant Christian, which means to me that seemed completely wrong. But then looking at it through the Jewish side, it actually made sense. And this is what I was actually talking about with Swan Sona earlier today, uh, which is the fact that um, these things of the church, all of these actions and sacraments are better understood through a Jewish lens than they could be through a Protestant lens, if that makes sense. Yeah, you know, you're talking here about the temple and, um, you know, its, it's uh, roots there uh, for the Catholic faith. It reminds me of some things that I read with St. Bede. He has actually a, a couple works where he goes over the temple and also the tabernacle. And he goes over the primary text in the Old Testament, and he shows how they typologically and allegorically apply to Christ in the church. And it's the most beautiful thing. And, um, you know, this is something that actually we, we see a lot whenever we have these discussions about the Jewish roots of the Catholic faith. You start to look at the temple, you see the things right. that are in the temple, and uh, note how they point to Christ. Uh, you know, when whenever you began to encounter that, what what was your experience there? What did you think? Um, I started noticing the similarities. I guess to, that was really what made me feel comfortable with the church. Mm. Now, like I mentioned before, um, some of the things that started attracting me to the church was the fact that there was authority. Mm -hmm. But then when I started looking at things like typology. And I saw, for example, the Blessed Mother there. Yeah, uh, she was the Ark of the New Covenant because right. we, if we compare the Book of Second Samuel, and and of course when we go to the Book of Luke, it was very purposely written down by Luke in that way, as to call to mind what we see in the Old Testament scriptures, where you know the amount of time that. The ark stood in the house of Obededom, and how long Miriam, Mary, stood in the house of Elizabeth. Uh, the phrase that Elizabeth uses: "How can how can it be that the mother of my Lord should come to me?" And David also, back in the day, would say, "How is it that the ark of the Lord would come to me?" So when I started looking at typology in mm -hmm. specific, it it seemed quite clear to me. That all of this was intentional. And again, it, this whole theme of fluidity, that we look at Temple Judaism and we see the Catholic Church. And this is something that I don't think a lot of people realize even within the Catholic Church. It's the fact that the kingdom of Israel, it, it wasn't destroyed just because the temple was destroyed. It was fulfilled Mm -hmm. through Yeshua, through Jesus. And he was continued. It was brought to where God wanted to take it. And I gave an analogy uh, not too long ago on, on my Instagram page. I said that basically Israel was a, a bud, like a flower bud. And the Catholic Church is the opened and blossomed flower. That's what it is. It wasn't uh, a cap. When, when the temple was destroyed, it wasn't the end. It was, let's go to the next chapter. Mm -hmm. So making all of these collection uh, connections through typology, looking at the way that the temple resembles what we see in Yeshua, mm -hmm. seeing how even the commandments are fulfilled. And I'm thinking specifically of the biblical feasts. For example, oh, yeah. we find in the biblical feast in uh, Leviticus 23, my favorite one to compare is uh, Pesach which is the Passover. Right. We see that Yeshua fulfills this perfectly. And even Shaul, Paul talks about this when he says that Yeshua is our Pesach. Mm -hmm. So all of the feasts are fulfilled, including the Shabbat, the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. All of these things are fulfilled in Yeshua. So when I started seeing all of these connections and I saw how it was so fluid in the Catholic Church, 
Mm. It was undeniable um, that this is where I needed to be. I couldn't stop myself, even with the fact that in my past I was anti-Catholic. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't run away from it. You know, there, there's a series of books out there by Dr. Brent Petrie, which uh, he, he's going to be coming on the show. We were just talking the other day. And and Dr. Oh, Scott Hahn, he, he's been on the show a few times. He's also kind of done some work in this area, but especially Dr. Petrie. Um, yes. You know, he has the Jewish roots of the papacy and things like that, Jewish roots of the Eucharist. Um, did, did that influence you or did you come to a, a knowledge of these things uh, you know, separately? No, I, I, I've never even heard of those books before, though. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I actually ended up getting into these books because I had already started seeing some of these connections. Um, and then somebody had recommended them to me and I yeah. said, oh, this is exactly what I was seeing. And of course... This man is is a genius. God has really yeah. gifted him with the ability to be able to make these connections. Um, so when I saw these things, he he basically brought them to light in a deeper sense. But there were things that I was starting to understand. I think really the hardest thing for me to be able to connect on my own was Jesus and the Jewish roots of Mary. Mm -hmm. Because that was really my biggest struggle um, in coming to agreement with the Catholic church. Mm -hmm. I, I could intellectually grasp it in a sense, but it wasn't until I started looking at the blessed mother through the eyes of typology, right. looking at all of these things from temple Judaism, rabbinic writings, looking at scripture with a new set of eyes, because I wasn't looking at her as a random Jewish girl, but I was seeing her as this masterpiece which God had in mind before the beginning of the earth being created. Mm -hmm. So when I started looking at it through that lens, intellectually, I got it. But it took me a while to even embrace it um, in the sense of the heart. And that was really a big struggle for me. But now I'm at the point where I'm praying the rosary every day. I have images of the Blessed Mother in my house. Mm -hmm. And it's like constant communication because I've learned that it's more about the heart than it ever was about intellect, especially when it comes to the Blessed Mother. Sounds like in many ways we're we're the same person because one of the <laughs> biggest difficulties for me was the Marian doctrines. But what helped was exactly what you just noted, typology wow. in the Old Testament Amazing. of the, the Virgin. That's really what helped. And I still I, I began to see it intellectually as far as the typology, but I was still a little uncomfortable. It wasn't until I actually became Catholic that I, I started to become comfortable with it. But yeah, the typology, you mentioned some of it already. I mean, her being the new Ark of the Covenant, that helped yeah. me tremendously um, because several of the, the Marian doctrines um, build on that typology. And yeah. um, so it, it really helped me. And, and I imagine that's what you're referencing as well, especially the Ark absolutely. of the Covenant content. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I think that was exactly the same for me. It was the biggest realization mm -hmm. because through it, we understand the perpetual virginity of the Blessed Mother because just as the Ark was so holy that it could not be touched. Look what right. happened to Uzzah when he tried to, right. in, in a good intention, he tried to stop the Ark from falling and then he gets zapped, right. right? He dies on the spot. And if you look at what we see through the church, we learned that also Miriam, the Blessed Mother, maintained herself a, as a virgin. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, we have the whole queen of heaven mm -hmm. and earth. And mm -hmm. then we look at the book of Revelations 11, 12, and how she is the ark. And I never saw that before that, which is crazy yeah. because when I was in the Protestant circle and when I was in Messianic Judaism, we really, I guess we're proud of the fact that we were so scripturally based, but I never saw this before, especially in that little tiny division between chapter 11 at the end of it and chapter 12 of the book of Revelation, where it tells us, that Yohanan, John, saw the ark, you know, and he, then he hears thunder and all of these things, right? He hears thunder, the ark is revealed, and then it transforms to it, the fact that he's talking about a woman who is, you know, crowned with 12 stars, and the, she's clothed in the sun and the moon at her feet. And then I'm like, wait a second, this is the Blessed Mother. This is what mm -hmm. all these 
church fathers have been saying. This is not new. They knew this. They knew these things. Why didn't I know this if I was so historically and scripturally based? But yeah, so the typology really, and specifically the Ark, and of course the new Eve also helped a lot. Yeah. Um, that took Justin, it to a whole new level. Yeah, Justin and also Irenaeus bring bring that one out a lot. You know, for yeah. the last hang up for me was the um the uh, assumption of the virgin but what i found interesting is from i believe it's psalm 132 it says arise O lord and come to your resting place you and your ark of of your might or something like that and yes it, it that applies if the virgin is the new ark of the covenant she as yep. well goes to the resting place with with christ as so that there you see the typology of yes. the um assumption and, and that really helped and in fact uh you can see in the nova Ordo liturgy um when it comes to the uh feast of the assumption that verse is is used uh wow. so i mean there there's an explicit recognition of that that typology that really helped for me i, I don't know if you've you've encountered that one before that's very new to me actually what yeah. what helped me with the assumption was actually the whole thing of the arc and the vision of John, right? When he sees the ark in heaven, why would right. it be in heaven if the Blessed right. Mother's not there? Especially when he tells us that he sees her there. So now that you're saying this, this is actually yeah, amazing. It, that... <laughs> it blows up my mind. This is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and this one thing, the reason why it blows up my mind is because every single Shabbat, every mm. single Sabbath, we say that very same prayer, that mm. scripture. Mm. That's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, it, and you know, some some are gonna say, okay, well, y'all are just going way too far with the typology. Listen, the New <laughs> Testament authors use typology constantly, and they use it to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, uh, he I did mean, it himself. Yeah, Jesus himself engaged in typology explicitly and uh right. taught that everything in the old testament applied to himself but you also see paul matthew and others using typology explicitly paul talks about yeah. it again explicitly allegory um but yeah. you see matthew quoting hosea and it in context it applies to the nation of israel but then he applies it to jesus because Jesus yeah. is the ultimate, if you will, the embodiment of the uh, people of Israel. So it, it, it's a both yeah. and kind of thing. So exactly. whenever we engage in this typology, we're we're just doing the same that the New Testament authors did. And and so whenever exactly. people contest that, I just think, how are you even a Christian? <laughs> you know, how, how do you even <laughs> believe Jesus is the Messiah? You you know, Peter, for example. To mm -hmm. prove the resurrection, he's appealing to the book of Psalms and to a psalm right. that applied to David, not explicitly wow. yeah. to anybody else. It applied to David, and he applies that right. to Jesus to prove the resurrection. So I, I just think, yeah. how can you even be a Christian if if you deny the use <laughs> of typology? You know. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I think it's always selective because a lot of people within outside of the church, right, Protestant mm -hmm. circles, they they do type in a different way mm -hmm. uh, they just don't want to take it in in this full length but what bothered me when i discovered for example the comparison between second samuel and the book of luke was the fact that it was way too obvious like literally if you take it line by line it's almost like a play-by-play -play right. of something from the way in the past and from that moment so I think it's just some people like to pick and choose, but then again, that's Protestantism. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that that's definitely it. And then you know, some have said it's kind of this regulative idea that uh, you know, well, we know that the New Testament authors engaged in typology, but we can't we can't use any kind of typology that is not in the New Testament itself. We can't go beyond mm -hmm. that. But that's not how the early Christians understood typology. Like, like you, right. you mentioned there with the New Eve, they're engaging in typology all over the place. Yep. Justin, Irenaeus, and quite a few others, they're using typology that isn't explicitly in the New Testament. I would say it's rooted in it, but it's not. It's right. not something that the New Testament authors explicitly connected themselves. They don't connect those dots, mm -hmm. like the New Eve, um, in the way that maybe some of the uh, later apostolic fathers do. 
And, and right. so the witness of the earliest Christians is to, uh, you know, even go beyond what some of the New Testament authors did. So yeah, uh, that, that's kind of always been my my response to people who would just say, OK, no, yeah, uh, I don't want to do this typology stuff. <laughs> now, uh, I, I see some really good questions here. Uh, let me um, take just a, a few of these. Unum Sanctum asks, yeah. why did Daniel accept Catholicism and not Eastern Orthodoxy? Yeah, good question. Well, it yeah. goes back to what I mentioned before. It's all about the authority factor. Yep. And again, looking at it through the Jewish lens, when I see the example that we see throughout Scripture, uh, we look at the story in uh, Yeshayahu in Isaiah 22, where it tells us about Eliakim and Shevna, and it tells us about the steward. Then I compared it to the writings of Rashi, which is, you know, debatably one of the greatest commentators of the scriptures in Jewish literature. Rashi makes it obvious and clear that this section in the book of Isaiah is talking about not just a random position, but somebody who is kingly and priestly which is exactly what the papacy is. And you cannot deny the papacy. The other factor is the fact that the church was always united. Think about that factor. If they were always under the papacy until then later on, because of all these controversies that started happening, the division between politics and language and culture, but it was all united before. And then we also look at the example of scripture. It just seemed obvious to me. In addition to that was the fact that I started to see what's happening with the Eastern Orthodox churches now, and this is quite mm -hmm. unfortunate. Mm -hmm. But if we look at, for example, the patriarchy between Constantinople and what we see in uh, in Russia right now in, in Istanbul, it, they're really having a big conflict and they're shooting schism accusations against each other mm -hmm. so they're not even united in their own so there's no such thing as the eastern orthodox church rather churches mm -hmm. so because of all of that um and what we just spoke about what we see in scripture catholicism was the only choice that seemed obvious yeah that, that's what did it for me as well is is authority the magisterium you know i had a brief um detour after becoming catholic in 2012 had a brief detour to eastern orthodoxy for about three years but i came back ultimately for the same convictions that i originally converted um to catholicism over orthodoxy and that is authority it, it ultimately boils down to that so yeah you're you're spot yeah. on uh benjamin asks this uh how does daniel reconcile the shema uh with the doctrine of the trinity well, this is something that uh, a lot of people struggle with, specifically in the Messianic Jewish movement, but it really takes a good knowledge of Hebrew to understand it. Uh, so the Shema says, Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. The word Echad is the controversy because everybody uh, has their own definition. But the thing is this, Hebrew words don't just have one meaning. Mm -hmm. Echad means uh, unity. It means one. And some people debate about whether it should be like Yahid, which numerically means one. Mm -hmm. But there is no issue. And actually, a, a good rendition of the Shema is Hero Israel, the Lord our God alone, as in listen to him only mm -hmm. and only him. And this makes perfect sense. In addition to that, even if when, when you look at the way that rabbis talk about the, the Shema, they talk about, uh, they say that the Shema is a prayer that points to the unity of God. Unity of what? Mm -hmm. What is being united in him? It's mm -hmm. the unification of God within himself. So it's actually not a big issue. And on top of that, once more, if you look at the sefirot, which are the, the attributes of, if you will, of God, where mm -hmm. this is this is looking more into Kabbalah, the more mystical side of Judaism, where it tells us about these different, um, not parts of God, really, but just well, I guess actually that's a good word. It's different parts to God. So even in Orthodox Judaism, God gets these different sides to him of course that that's actually worse than the trinity because in the trinity we recognize that there are no parts to god he's still one in essence um but there are just three persons which are related mm -hmm. to each other because of 
God being love. And that's really the key to it, to uh, understanding God as love. Mm -hmm. And then it all clicks. So, yeah, it doesn't actually have any issues with the Shema. Yeah, that's what St. Augustine really draws out in his book on on the Trinity. As he, he, mm. he, you know, draws out the Trinity there with uh, love and, you know, gift concepts like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. There was another one I saw here that looked good. Uh, here it is. Um, what would you say is the best argument for being Catholic instead of Jewish? And could you recommend some good resources on the topic? <laughs> okay, so the question is kind of a, a funny one because you don't stop being Jewish just because you're Catholic. Mm -hmm. Yeshua is Jewish, right? Mm -hmm. His body is still exists. The Blessed Mother is still Jewish. The Apostle is Jewish. Uh, but if you mean why I don't go towards rabbinic Judaism, mm -hmm. it's, again, authority. Even the rabbis will tell you, at least honest rabbis will tell you, that the transmission of authority known as smicha, mm -hmm. it doesn't exist anymore. So any rabbi right now that claims any sort of authority doesn't even have it. Everything was lost after the destruction of the temple. And I want you to think about this. The same way that Israel was wandering in the desert for 40 years, and their problem was doubting God's solution. This is exactly what happened after Yeshua, where around 30 AD, when Yeshua came and he began his ministry, 40 years later, the destruction of the temple happened, which, what does that mean? It means that, again, Israel was left in a spiritual wilderness where they had the option to either trust God or doubt his solution to the problem. What was the solution to the temple being about to be destroyed? It's coming to Yeshua. It's going to the new priesthood. The Levitical priesthood doesn't exist anymore. The high priest, as they knew it, doesn't exist anymore. The sacrifices don't exist anymore. Actually, I, I don't mean to shout myself out, but I have a video on this very topic. It's called the temple, the sacrifice, and the high priest. And I think that will give you a little bit more knowledge on what I'm talking about. Good. Um, so VM asks, do you still adhere to Jewish traditions? And how do you combine that with your Catholic faith? Yeah, absolutely. Again, <laughs> I have another video on this. It's called The Ultimatum. Um, if we look at the book of Acts chapter 20, uh, 21, I believe, verse 20, it tells us about how Paul had been going throughout the Gentile world, basically preaching the, the good news of Yeshua, the Messiah. And so many people were joining the movement. But then he comes back to Jerusalem and he speaks with Yaakov, known as James. And when he tells this to James, he replies and tells him, that's amazing, that's great that it's all happening, but check out what's happening in Jerusalem. So many people are coming to be believers in Yeshua and they are zealous for the Torah. And they don't say, oh, and they need to stop keeping the commandments. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, Yaakov tells uh, Shaul that he has to go pay for the uh, vows for these four men that are coming with him where they're going to do the Nazarene vow. So there is nothing in scripture or in tradition that tells us that we have to stop keeping Jewish traditions. But there's a key point and um, Cardinal Burke, an amazing man, yeah. prince of the church, he actually has this interview with the head of this organization known as the Association for Hebrew Catholics, yeah. um, where he tells people right there that if you're Jewish and you want to keep these traditions, it's completely fine, yeah. albeit you need to remember that you're doing it through the lens of Mashiach right. and in agreement with the magisterium of the church. And, and not so, for justification or anything like that. Right, I mean, I yeah, that. nothing like that. I was actually going to bring that up because um, I, you know, I recall him a while back. Um, they had a video of, of him on their, their website. I don't know if it's still mm. up, but yeah, mm. uh, yeah, it, there, there's a whole lot here. Um, you know, there, I don't know if you've read the debate b between Augustine and Jerome on this topic. That, that was fun. <laughs> and then of course, Florence and all that. Uh, a whole, in fact, I, I think maybe you, we should do a show. Maybe you and I should do a show on this very <laughs> topic and also incorporate, uh, you know, Cardinal Burke. How do we yeah. deal with that in light of Florence? And how do we deal with that in light of Augustine and 
Jerome, yeah. and then, of course, the New Testament itself, because I get a lot of questions on this very topic itself. Mm. Uh, so I, th I think a whole lot could be said here. I think that'd be a really okay. fun show. Um, I think that would be great. Let's see. Robbie asks, uh, how easy was the transition to recognize that the priesthood has now continued in the line of Melchizedek after coming from an anti-sacerdotal Christianity? That's a good point. If I look at it from that side, it was difficult because I didn't see a need for the priesthood. I, I was taught, you know, in, in Protestant Christianity that Yeshua, Jesus, is the high priest and he officiates everything. But it, it actually doesn't make sense if you look at what the scriptures tell us, because again, as, as you mentioned before in the book of Malachi, it tells us that a sacrifice will be offered everywhere in the world. But how is this happening? How is there any sacrifice? So it all comes to knowing that there has to be a sacrifice. And for somebody to be offering the sacrifice, there needs to be a priesthood. So tying that to the book of Hebrews, where it, um, I believe it's Shaul who authored that book. Um, if you take all of that together, it makes sense that it's necessary because if the sacrifice is there and we know that the Eucharist is a sacrifice, then it's absolutely necessary for there to be a priesthood. And again, this really ties back down to what we see in the example of Temple Judaism, where you do have a priesthood. So we spoke before about the authority and the court, the Beit Din Hagadol, but then you also have this aspect, which is the priesthood. So. If I looked at it, again, through the Jewish sense, it's easy. If I look at it through the Protestant side, it's difficult because I never saw a need for it. But once I started looking more into the Jewish background of things, it clicked for me. And it was much more easy and accommodating for me at that point. Xavier asks, uh, does Florence condemn the observance of the Mosaic law? Yeah, that, that's what I was saying is, is um, there, there's a lot of work that needs to be done here, and I definitely intend to do. Uh, I don't know if you want to take a quick stab at it, but I definitely intend to do a video on it. Yeah, I'll, I'll do a quick version to that reply because I've actually had, mm -hmm. had people ask me this before. Yeah, The issue really comes about the reason why you're keeping the Mosaic law. Right. And I'll just leave it at that. It really has to do with your purpose, your intention, uh, and your goal. And let's do a show about it because I think that's a really, really good yeah, topic. Yeah, because, he, you know, even there's some things in Florence that talk about, you know, you, you can't even get circumcised, even if you don't intend to be justified by the circumcision. And that's what's mm -hmm. throwing a lot of people off. And so right. I think that that would be a really good show. How do we reconcile that with maybe Cardinal Burke's position? And, you know, right. Like that. Um, Absolutely. And let's see here. Uh, oh, this is another good one from Xavier. What's the most convincing Old Testament prophecy of Christ for you? Um, uh, it's not necessarily a prophecy, but mm -hmm. this is one that not too many people talk about. It's actually the story of Moshe, Moses, when he goes up Mount Sinai and he gets the tablets of stone. The tablets of stone are the word of God made physical. And because of the sins of the people at the bottom of the hill, they get destroyed, they get crushed. But then there's a second coming when these tablets come once again, but glorified. And these don't get destroyed. This was the perfect imagery for me to be able to see Yeshua as the one. Because the debate for a lot of Jewish people is the Messiah can't die. He shouldn't die. Uh, there's no such thing as a second coming. But it's actually quite clear if you look at it through this lens, which is the tablets of stone get brought down. The word of God made physical, which is Yeshua made flesh. He is crushed for the sins of the people. Right, he is crushed for our iniquities, and then leaves, comes back, and that was actually one of the biggest things. And of course, Isaiah also, the suffering servant. The reason why that one's also really big for me is the fact that they took that out purposefully. Rabbinic authorities took that out of the weekly readings. Um, so every Shabbat we have what we call the the parsha. And of the Parsha, which is basically a segment, a reading of the Torah, 
and then the Haftarah, which is the prophets, the Nevi'im. So that specific section that used to be read all the time was taken out. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because it was so obvious that it was speaking about Yeshua. Um, let's see. This one is from uh, Taste. Have you guys heard about salvation? It's from the Jews. So yeah, Roy, Roy Showman. He's been, he's been on the show before. In fact, I, I was on his show about three times back in like 2014, 2015. And then I had him on maybe about yeah. a year and a half ago. That's amazing. I would love to have another conversation. A while, this is like way before I started getting into Catholicism. Mm -hmm. I actually had a conversation with him uh, via Skype. I would love mm -hmm. to have another conversation with him at another point. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, they, they suggest having uh, us three all on, on the show. I think that'd be fun. That'd be really uh, cool. Let's see. I'm seeing anything else in here. Um. I'm not seeing any others. I'll, I'll ask for one more call of questions. Go ahead and send them to at reason and theology. Um, in the meantime, however, just tell us how, how your experience is going with, you know, being a catechumen and, uh, you know, studying the faith and uh, all that stuff. Well, it's been really humbling for me, to be honest with you. Um, I've always been a type of person that categorized myself as somebody who bases everything in their life according to logic and reason. And that caused me to be a lover of knowledge. And I love studying. And I thought I knew so many things about the Catholic Church. But when I had to come to this point where I have to actually become a catechumen, I'm going all the way to the very beginning to God is love. What does that mean? What is happiness? And at first I'm like, God, why are you putting me in this situation? I already know all this stuff. That was my reaction. But then I understood that it's not about head knowledge. It's the same thing that happened with me and the Blessed Mother. It's not about head knowledge. That's the easy part. The hard part is opening your heart up to God truly. Uh, so the experience has been humbling, but at the same time, it's been amazing. I will say that we're a, with a very holy and righteous jealousy. I envy the people that are able to partake of the Eucharist. And every time that I'm there at Mass and I'm just looking at it, I can't hold back the tears. I'm just like, God, please let me be there already. Mm -hmm. So if you're Catholic and you're taking advantage of this situation, I hope you really are taking advantage because you're blessed. And mm. hopefully I'll be there soon. Yeah. Um, Unum Sanctum, what do you think about anti-Jewish statements from church fathers? Um, I, I answer this actually quite a lot. I get this a lot. I, mm. I acknowledge the fact that there have been a lot of anti-Semitic things being said by even great men within the church. But... The words of some don't mean the words of the church necessarily. That's number one. You can't equate somebody's opinion to the whole church, regardless of how mighty their other works may be. Uh, in addition to that, I've always, because I've been seeing both sides, right? From the Jewish side, I've been seeing from the believers in Yeshua side, and everybody says mean things. Like the Birkat Haminim, which is basically this blessing that gets done on in synagogue, which is a curse, really, against believers in Jesus. So everybody says mean, mean things to each other. So my, my thought on that is there's no point on dwelling on it. W literally, what's the point? There is nothing beneficial on, on just harping on those issues. I just recognize that that's their opinion. And it's faulty because, you know, we just need to recognize the fact that this is where we come from. Mm -hmm. Our roots are Jewish and we just need to learn to embrace that, especially now when so many more Jews are starting to come into the church. And mm -hmm. I think it's mark my words, man. I'm telling you, there is going to be a lot more coming in very soon. Mm -hmm. I see it. I feel it. I'm, I'm seeing when I see the movement that's going on in Israel right now. So many Jews, even Orthodox Jews, are coming to believe in Yeshua. Mm. So in the church, if anybody is still holding on to these anti-Semitic sentiments or any type of weird feeling against the Jewish people, I think it's time for us to start really learning to embrace our yeah. brother. 
And, and and to remember, I mean, one of the signs of the second coming is that the Jewish people will be converted to the church. So, That's um, right. you know, keeping that in mind, we we really need to have an emphasis on bringing the faith to them in fact that's what the new testament does i mean it's to the right. jew first and then to the greek i mean to them yeah. along the covenants and all that and so uh they right. they they were worshiping the one god while we were still sacrificing humans to you know pagan deities <laughs> and stuff like that so right. to them <laughs> it's the gospel and so i mean we i think we really need to have more of an emphasis on um on, yeah. on that so i i wholeheartedly agree with you you know one of the things that i've kind of noticed about not not only just some church fathers but yeah some in the church and maybe some fathers had some anti-semitic tendencies maybe um mm -hmm. i think a lot of it however and i i'm not necessarily saying this applies to some of the people today because some of the people i've seen mm -hmm. today are i think just racist but um i think some of the statements of some fathers at least to me aren't anti-semitic per se they're anti-judaism in other words um it, it seems like what they're opposing maybe not in all cases i'm just saying in some yeah. is the religion itself and not necessarily right. the people or their ethnicity or something like that you know and and i kind of get that a little bit more i kind of understand why they they had that mentality um yeah you know i i definitely get why but i think sometimes it comes across as anti-semitic and so um i wonder sure. if that is what it is sometimes what has that kind of been your observation as well yeah that and more specifically from what i've observed it's not when they say the jews or something of that nature it's not just talking about jews in general rather talking about people who know this is people who they you know, they were there. Yeah. And that they know they're blatantly rejecting the Messiah. You give them yeah. the facts and they reject. But what we need to realize is that most Jews, specifically nowadays, they have no idea. Right. Nobody's telling them anything. Right. So we can't say, oh, the Jews this, the Jews that. When was the last time you spoke to a Jew and tried to tell him about Yeshua? And and this Probably is never where, right. And this is where I think some of the the fathers made sometimes some assumptions that they should not have made. And mm -hmm. you start to, you start to see a change when it comes to the right. discovery of the new world prior to the discovery of the new world. Uh, Christians mm -hmm. tended to assume that everybody was, um, vincibly ignorant at best. In other words, right, they right. were, they were, intentionally and actively denying the gospel and had been sufficiently presented the gospel and still rejecting it and being obstinate right. against it. They assumed that that was always the case. And, you know, I can kind of get the disposition of, well, we want we don't want to assume invincible ignorance. I get that. But mm -hmm. I think they sometimes really neglected the idea of invincible ignorance and when it came to the discovery of the new world you start to see a change there when it comes to the christian tradition we we really yeah. start to uh no longer just always assume that and we realize that okay some people uh might need a just a little bit more than just being told the gospel they they might need to be presented the gospel in a convincing way and then if they reject it now can say they're being obstinate so i think this was one of the one of the deficiencies and inadequacies i should say in the patristic and even early medieval era uh the, mm -hmm. and i think that there there was a change there again with the discovery of the new world for reasons yeah. i've talked about on previous shows so i think that also kind of accounts for some of those sayings and the fathers i'm not saying it accounts for all of them I think right, it just correct. accounts for some. So I think it's important to kind of contextualize some of these things. They're assuming Absolutely. everybody who is Jewish is actively rejecting the gospel and has been presented the gospel in such a convincing way that they're now obstinately denying the right. truth. And that's not exactly the case. That, that's, that's not <laughs> neither then or now. Um, that's just a perfect point. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm... Oh, one last one here. Yeah. Uh, did you notice the Godhead in the Old Testament before your uh, conversion, like the angel of the Lord, 
uh, God and Abraham, you know, Genesis 22, all that. What, what do you think? Well, for me, remember, I wasn't raised as a child in Judaism. I was raised as a Pentecostal Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't until later that I got into the Judaism side of things. And even within that form of Judaism, Yeshua and the Godhead was acknowledged. Um, but yeah, I was able to make the, the links afterwards and I was able to understand more and specifically what we spoke earlier in this conversation about the Shema. That was really an eye opener for me to really make sure because there was a time, there was a time that I was very uncertain about the Trinity. And I actually ended up making a video on my channel. This is way back in the day. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I don't believe in the Trinity. And I gave my reasons why. Mm -hmm. Something happened where I was not even able to make any more videos. It's like God stopped me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You really mm -hmm. messed up this time. And I just, I lost all motivation to create any content. Mm -hmm. And then God brought me back into the realization, you got to get things straight. When I did so, that's when my my channel, I really started producing more content and things like that. So yeah, I guess at a very personal level, I also got that understanding that God is who he is. He's triune mm -hmm. and the scriptures do support it. Well, Daniel, go ahead and put in a plug, not only for your channel, but anything else you want to direct the audience to. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so for anybody that wants to find any of my work, you can find me either on Instagram or on YouTube, both under the same name. That is The Jewish Catholic. And if you ever want to email me, reach out with any questions, the email is thejewishcatholicofficial at gmail.com. That's pretty much for me. I don't I don't have any Patreons or anything like that, uh, at least not at the moment. Maybe God willing at some point, because I, I do hope to get more serious with these things um, in terms of producing content. Uh, one thing that I will ask for anybody that's watching is please pray for my family and I as we are in the process of being officially part of the church. Just because, you know, RCIA gets shut down every so often because of the state of emergency and whatnot. So just pray for us that God opens the door so that we can be officially in communion mm -hmm. with the church already. Excellent. Really appreciate Excellent. that. Yeah. And, 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 you know, you know, the tradition catechumens, they, they are Catholics. <laughs> so oh, we, we've had yeah. that tradition for a very, very yeah. long time. Yeah. Oh, Daniel, man. I really appreciate you coming on and um, I'd love to have you back on. Let's do it, man. I'm excited for that other conversation that you hinted at. So let's talk about that would be a little bit. One that. If, if, if yeah. we maybe do that one uh, together. So what we'll do is I'll, I'll discuss details off the air. I think that would be really good. So Fantastic. All right. Well, again, thank you for coming on. Everybody, thank you for watching. Of course, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Hit the bell for notification uh, so that you can uh, be made known of uh, you know future shows when I go live, all that good stuff. Also, of course, don't forget to hit the like button and check us out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support us and you also get access to extra content. All right. Until next time. God bless.